Thank you, Pastor Terry. Thank you, Harry. Wonderful job as usual. Good morning, Salt and Light Church. It's good to not see you. <laughs> that part's not good, but it's good to know that you're there. A um, couple of things, I'm just going to add on to what Terry did with family business. The, uh, the media now, is that what it's called, media now? Yeah. Um, I went on there. I had, I'd, I'd heard the name of it. Uh, Pastor Caitlin called me about it a little over a week ago and said, boy, you know, we want to get something for our kids. And, uh, and, and I, like I said, I hadn't heard of it, but, you know, I trust our people. And I was like, yeah, let's do that. And, but I went on this week and looked, and, man, there is just a lot of good stuff on there. If you haven't, you got to make a little account, but it's not hard to do. If you haven't done that, uh, there's just good stuff on there. Whatever it is you're looking for from uh, kind of motivational speakers and apologetics and kid stuff. And uh, there's just a lot of things on there that uh, it, if you are ever just sitting at home, like, hey, I kind of wish that I had something to watch. And it's, it's better than uh, Matlock or whatever it might be that's on television. Uh, give it a look-see. Uh, I don't know how long we'll keep our subscription to it, but uh, as long as it's being useful, we will. And it seems very useful to me. So that's just a, a point there. Um, the, you know, Scripture says that we're not supposed to... You know, blow our own horns and you're not supposed to, you know, give credit. So I don't want to read the who all is doing uh, fasting for people. It would not be appropriate. So and it's, I'm going to read who's not. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but l please let me encourage you. If you think about fasting and, it, oh man, I was talking to a buddy of mine and, and fasting for 24 hours with because of his health and some other things, it's just very difficult. You don't have to fast for 24 hours. Uh, you can fast a, one meal. You can, you know, eat breakfast and go. You know, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna eat lunch today, and I'm gonna and spend that time praying. Uh, I know somebody that fasts from television because, uh, again, physical reasons. Not eating wouldn't be good for them. Uh, so. Be creative, think creatively. Uh, really what we're saying is we're gonna set aside something that we spend some time doing and enjoy doing uh, and, and take that time and invest it in praying for our folks that are today to, in, at this time down in Columbia. So let me encourage you, uh, again, we will never read the list of who is or who is not, but it is between you and the Lord. And uh, I encourage you just to think, how might I be able to do that? Just one time while folks are gone. I think that it's, uh, it's an important uh, step in our own discipleship, learning how to give stuff up sometimes. So that's all the, the family business that I will add for now. Uh, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 7. Uh, I'm going to be in Matthew chapter 5, but I want you to take a look real quick at, at Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. While you're turning to verse 24, if you, if you are, the, you know one of the things I like about our world? You don't have to know anything. You literally have to know nothing other than how to type in a question on YouTube. If you don't know how to fix your furnace, type in your furnace name, not heating, there's a YouTube video, it shows you how to fix it. If you're trying to figure out, okay, how do I get the keys out of my car, and, and you can go by model by model, it doesn't matter which model it is, you type in, how do I get my keys out of my uh, Pontiac 1997 uh, I locked them in, and it'll show you how you know you go through the trunk and up over through the sunroof or whatever it might be. There is a video for everything. I learned how to put a roof on a shed I, uh, a few years ago, well, probably 12 years ago now. I built a shop. I, I wanted to have a wood shop. I had been a, a wood shop teacher and thought, yeah, I'd really like to have a shop at my house. So I built a shop. I didn't know how to put the, li the lid on it, the roof on it. Uh, so I learned how to put down three tab shingles. Uh, which are those, you know, they're about this long and they're black and they're made out of asphalt or something, I don't know, but, uh, and they have three tabs on them. And I learned how to do that and I'd put it on my shop and, and it's worked great. And so a few years later, I decided I was gonna make a cedar shed. I needed a shed and so in the back corner of, lot of my lot, I, I put down a little foundation, I built the shed and I bought, instead of putting three tab shingles, I decided to put split cedar shakes on it, which is cedar shingles, but they're a little bit different. But I already knew how to put the roof on. 
And so I put it on exactly the same way that I put on uh, the, the three tab shingles on my shop. Well, this last year I went out into my shed and I looked up at the roof and, and it looked like it was molding. And I thought, oh, that's not good. So I went out after the rainy season started and I looked up and in my shed, in my shed uh, it's actually water coming through. And so I realized I've got a problem. So I got up on the roof of the shed and sure enough, the shingles were rotting and the wood underneath it was rotting. Uh, and, and that was perplexing to me because my shop, which I had done years longer, it was not leaking. So I went online and looked up and sure enough, it turns out that you don't install cedar shingles the way that you install three tab shingles. I didn't know that. I went on information that I had been having for a different idea and a different thing, and that information didn't work. So I tore all of that off and it was all rotten and I was up on the top of my shed working on it. And when I'm up there, one of the things that I know when you're standing up high is be careful. And I, it was, pieces of the shed were still a little bit unstable because they're a little bit rotty. And, uh, but I had to get some stuff done and so I'm spread out with my one hand on one rafter and one on the other and one foot on a piece of the, uh, of the wall, which I knew was a little iffy and it went through my mind, oh, gosh, this is a little risky. And sure enough, less than a minute later, the wall gave out and I fell <laughs> and I've got bruises on my shins and, 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 and on my elbows because my mind was telling me this is not a good idea but I still thought it was a good idea. Now here's why I say all that. We can have old information that's not good. And we can have warnings in our mind that tell us things and we ignore all of those sorts of things until something happens. So I'm gonna read you now what I told you to take a look at at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. The wise and foolish builders. Now remember, this is Jesus at the end of his sermon. He's, and, and the Sermon on the Mount probably took place over a number of days. It wasn't one sort of long oration. It was probably something that took place over three, four, five, six days. We don't know exactly. But he gets done with all of his teaching, and he finishes, he kind of wraps it up with this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the wind blew and beat against that house and yet it did not fall. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell with a great crash. Which reminds me of my shed and my body lying over the rafters of my shed. If we get the right information things work. If we work off of old information, oftentimes it doesn't. If we have a warning going off in our head and we ignore it, usually we end up paying the price for it. How that fits into where we're at now. Jesus is starting his sermon. He has gotten through and he said this, and this is real quick where we've been before. It says, repent. From that time on, Jesus taught this. Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And you're probably at home right now going, ah, oh, he's talking about repent again. I have to say this. There is no gospel message that doesn't start with this. There is no continuation of the gospel if it doesn't start here. It doesn't mean we'll say it every time. But if this hasn't taken place, nothing else matters. So this is the starting point. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And Jesus is going to go into his ministry and talk about this. And so he gets to chapter 5. And this week, last week, we talked about this. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. And this is important. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Just the ones who really wanted to follow him. Not this huge crowd, but just the ones who wanted to get there. And I'm assuming that's us. That we want to pursue Jesus Christ as a disciple, not as an observer. And so when these disciples go up to hear Jesus, they, they go away from the crowd and go up and hear Jesus beginning teaching that they are there with the intention of doing what it says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, building on a solid foundation. So I asked you last week, you and I have to consider this. Are we wanting 
a firm foundation? And if so, the answer to how you get that is this sermon. We have to listen to what Jesus is going to say, and this week and next is what we're going to cover uh, a substantial piece of that, is are we willing to say, if Jesus says it, I believe that's the foundation that I need, and I'm going to commit myself to get to that place. So, five, Matthew 5, chapter 20. This is, he, he has gone through the Beatitudes, which I said before, we're not going to cover that, and he, so now he's getting into his teaching on, on where, the, where he wants us to be. For I tell you that unless your righteousness, yours and mine, surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. So what's at stake? This kingdom of heaven that's come near. If our righteousness doesn't get better than the, the people who are talking about righteousness, we will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And then we get these six pieces that we're going to take a look at. You have heard that it was said. He says that five or six times in Matthew chapter 5, and then he's going to fix it. Jesus is changing. So if I had had a Jesus when I was building my cedar shed, he would have said, you have heard before to put a roof on this way, but I'm going to tell you how to do it right. And he would have saved me hundreds of dollars and a banged up shin. But I didn't have that. Here we do. But I tell you, so here we start. You have heard that it was said long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. We've heard that. We believe that. I'm convinced, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, that you probably believe that murder is out of bounds. You shall not murder, and if you do, you'll be subject to judgment. But Jesus is going to change the stream just a little bit. So he says, But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. So imagine that you are sitting, you've got, it's like, oh, Jesus is going to teach. I'm going to go up on the mountainside. I'm going to listen to him. There's a few of us who have gathered there. And Jesus starts off and he says, You've heard that murder is a bad thing. I'm going to change that just a little bit. I'm going to tell you, if you're even angry with a brother or sister, you'll be subject to judgment. Now, I've sat in a lot of meetings. I've sat in a lot of teachings. I tend to be the guy who sits about two-thirds of the way back by somebody that I like that has a similar personality to me. And I would have leaned over and said this, are you kidding me? Are you serious? I, don't, I think he's setting us up for like a punchline or something. Are you serious that if I am just angry with somebody that I'm subject to judgment? Because that doesn't seem reasonable. I might have even felt a little bit angry right then when he said it. Or I would have thought he was kidding. And then what I would have done, sitting here now just reading the scriptures, I would have pulled in some other knowledge. Because we, you know this verse, Ephesians 4, In your anger do not sin. Well, wait, but Jesus just said, if I'm angry with somebody, I'm subject to judgment, but oh, I'm going to use some other scripture to help me understand and refine what Jesus is saying a little bit, so I'm not quite as accountable. But here's the catch. That verse didn't exist. It didn't exist when Jesus said this. That piece that Paul's going to give to help us expand our understanding did not exist when Jesus was giving this sermon. And I'm going to make a little distinction here when I'm preaching this week and next, I am talking not about, or I'm talking about the text, not the topic. There's a difference. If I'm teaching on anger, and I'm not, if I am, then I'm going to pull in everything that the scripture says about anger. But I'm trying to get us to understand what's taking place in this text. And there will be a couple of times where you might want to expand out. And I'm, what I'm going to say is, no, we're talking about the Sermon on the Mount which precludes any clarification that anything else in Scripture is going to give. Jesus is dead serious when he's talking about this. I tell you, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. And so I can think, are you kidding me? Jesus is going to know. I'm thinking, that's awfully extreme. How could you possibly mean that? And so he's going to clarify too. He does it right now. Again. He doesn't walk it back at all. He says, again, 
anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, Raka is, a, is an Arabic term for contempt, and we have a lot of terms in our society for contempt. I won't list them off. But if you use a, some, any term of contempt towards another person, you're answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, watch what it says here, you fool will be in danger of the fires of hell. Jesus doesn't back off at all. He doesn't even pause for a second. He's very serious when he says, if you're angry with a brother or sister, read it down to the end. You're in danger of the fires of hell. See, what Jesus is trying to do is get his listeners to understand they're in a different game. They're not in the religious game anymore. They're not in the behavior is the determining factor anymore. It's not a matter you're mad, it's how you act when you're mad. Nonsense. Jesus isn't going to go for that. He's not going to say, you know, if you just have good anger management skills, that's what matters. Don't swear at somebody. It's okay, it's okay if you're mad at somebody, but handle it appropriately. Jesus is saying, no, that's not the case. The game is different. Harry's sitting over here, and Harry and I golf occasionally. We have a mutual friend named Ray. He calls him Jim. I'll tell you later why. But uh, there's a fourth guy who goes whose name's Brad. Well, Brad knows, and Harry knows, that Ray and I are in a game group. We play board games together with a couple of other guys. Well, Brad is always asking Ray if he can join our game group. And Ray, oh, and Brad will not watch this, but he might, because <laughs> Harry's going to tell Ray, uh, Brad that I mentioned him. But, but so Brad will say, oh, and, and so now that I've started golfing occasionally, he'll come up by me and say, hey, Dave, you've you got to get Ray to let me join in on the game group. This is true, right? Yeah. Every time I golf with him, I know it's coming. Hey, Dave, you've got to get uh, Ray to let me join in on the game group. And what Ray will say, which is absolutely true, is, Brad, you're familiar with Clue which has a four-page rule book. I just finished reading the rules for a game that we're going to play that had a 38-page rule book, a very small print. And what, what Ray's trying to say to Brad is, you don't understand the kind of games that we play. You will not find fun. And what Ray's wanting him to get is, it's a different world that, than you're thinking. This is what Jesus is doing. My kingdom is not what you're thinking. I'm going up here on the mountainside because I need you to understand, those of you who are really interested, I need you to understand it's a different game, the kingdom of God. It's a different game. And I, a, a game is an unfortunate term in this context, but it's the, the, the reality. That is, if you want to engage in what we're doing, the commitment level is absolutely different. The expectation level is absolutely different. If you just want to be religious, then just act like you're not mad. But if you want to be a follower of Jesus, you've got to understand how to change your heart. You've got to understand that it, it's an issue of what's inside you much more than what comes outside of you. All of us can act right at the right times, right? We act badly when we feel like we're in a place where it's safe for us to act badly. But if somebody's there that we want them to have a good opinion of us, we, we can fix how we act, but not necessarily what we've got going on on the inside. Jesus is trying to get them to understand the reality of kingdom. So he continues on. Verse 23 and 24. Therefore, now this seems like a, an abrupt shift, but it's not. Pay close attention here. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar. So he's now talking about that you're bringing a, an offering to the church. If you're offering your gift at the altar and there you remember your brother or sister has something against you, well, wait a minute. He was just talking about if I'm angry with someone else. If I'm angry with someone else, it's the equivalent of murder, kingdom-wise. But why did he switch here? Now he's saying if somebody has something against you. The reason is because if you're angry with somebody, if your heart's wrong against somebody, they have cause to have something against you. You are violating a kingdom principle when you have deep grievance against another person. Now, it's not the same. Somebody cuts you off on the freeway and you have this momentarily whoa, reactive, a quick reactive thing is not what this word is talking about when we're talking about anger. This is an internal dislike, aggression, 
malice towards somebody. If you have that, now he switches and says, if you're offering your gift and you know that somebody has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled with them. Now, our thinking and probably most uh, sort of appropriate behavior books that you'll find would say, hey, you know, if somebody has something against you, they need to come and tell you. Hey, yeah, you know, you really hurt my feelings. But what Jesus is doing is turning the tables. He's got a little lazy Susan of morality and he's spinning it around so that I'm here and I know I did something to Terry. And he's, no, that's not it. If I know that Terry might be upset with me, I'm supposed to go to him, not wait for him to come to me. If I somehow violate Terry, or I somehow violate Harry, or whoever it is that's here in the room or out there, and I'm at the altar, and it's like, Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving my gift to you. And this isn't just about giving a financial gift. This is about doing a service to God. He's saying, hit pause. And go and be reconciled to them first. Now, here's what I believe. 95% of divorces, broken relationships, church splits, people leaving churches would be solved if we just did what Jesus said. Because here's what's true. Nobody does this. Nobody. I can't think of, I was trying to, when I was working on this sermon, I was trying to think of the last time where I had somebody come to me and say, Hey, Dave, I remember I, I, I did this. I, I said this thing, and it sounded kind of sideways. And 95% of the time, again, I use 95% frequently today, but that most of the time it's missed by the other person, but not always. I, if I said something sort of sideways, Terry, because he loves me and he knows I love him, it probably just washed right off him, but I don't know. Because once in a while something sits and festers and spreads. And so what Jesus is doing here is he's saying, not only are you responsible if you are angry with somebody, you're responsible if somebody might be angry with you also, right? Who's the responsibility on when I'm the one hurt? Me. Who's the responsibility on when the other person's hurt? Me. If both of us are followers of Jesus, then we've got four responsibilities for two people. I'm responsible for me and for the other person, and the other person is responsible for them and for me. It's a four times fail safe for relationship if we just did what Jesus said. Now you see it continues on. Settle matters quickly with your adversary. We're not going to touch a lot on this because just for time, but settle matters quickly. But I want you to see this. Let me pull out most of the words. Your brother, your sister, your adversary. Who's this interested in? Everybody. Because you guys are my brothers and sisters. You're not my adversaries, mostly. Maybe there's one out there. I'm not aware of one. But if there was one, even if there was one, if there was somebody out there who's like, that Pastor Dave, man, we got to get him out of that church. He's running it sideways. It's off the rails. And that, all of a sudden, you're my adversary. I'm still responsible for you. I'm still responsible for you. Why? Because I can't change you. I have to care about you. So we have this, your brother, your sister, your adversary, what happens in order of operations? First, I fix it. Before I continue on pursuing my relationship with God, first, I fix it. If I'm doing my faith and I've got issues between me and somebody else, first, go. And you know what, that, what the best word to substitute in there is? Repent. Change directions. What we tend to do is go full throttle anger or full throttle aversion. Well, I know, I know, I, I, Terry's mad at me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out the other door so I don't have to go by Terry. I, I, I'm going to pretend I didn't see that text. Yeah, I, I, I know, I'm going to see Terry later at a meeting. Maybe, maybe I'm going to call in sick for that one. We either avoid it or we let it fester inside of us. Repent. It's the same message all the time. Change your direction. So it continues on. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. Again, almost everyone everywhere in every society agrees with this. It's part of the Ten Commandments, right? You're not supposed to murder. You're not supposed to commit adultery. So, but Jesus is saying you, you, you've heard that. 
And if you're sitting on the mountainside going, man, how's he going to mix this one up? But he's going to. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And you know what I'm thinking? You have got to be kidding me. If I'm sitting there, I just got through listening to Jesus talk about being angry and murder, and now he's going to talk about adultery, and he's going to say, I'm sitting there going, I haven't committed adultery. I've never even been married. Most of these guys weren't married yet. They're young guys. If you look at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. Really? I got nothing to offer. If we had a room full of people and I pulled the men and I said, is there anybody here who has not ever looked lustfully at a female show of hands other than one joker, nobody would raise their hand. Now, to be fair, and I'm not going to do a lot of teaching on what this is specifically meaning, because remember, I'm talking about the text instead of the subject, but this isn't saying that you, somebody catches your eye and you have a momentarily, whoa. That's actually not what this is talking about. This, is called, this word lustfully means to look at someone with intent, meaning that you are, have focused on it to a point where it's like this, that's, I'm going to, I would consider acting on that, whether you ever do or not. So it's, it's, it's a little bit more that it's not, there, uh, I don't remember which wise person said this, but it said that you can't stop a bird from landing on your head, but you can stop it from building a nest there. And that made sense to me that the, the momentary, particularly how people dress in today's society, stuff catch, catch your eye. That's not what it's talking about. But it is saying not much past that. Now. I still remember today, I was at a sermon one time, it was a, it was a men's meeting, and it was a, but the guy was giving a sermon, and he went very uh, kind of explicitly into the sort of ramifications of this. I'm not going to do that for two reasons. It tainted the person to me because of the things that, the, that they said. This doesn't need much more explanation if I was talking about the topic. It's saying that the bar has been raised. So. Anyone looks at a woman lustfully, has already committed adultery with them. Now look what he says. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. And you know what I would say? You've got to be kidding me. And he's not. But he's not saying to gouge your eye out. What he's saying is the extreme level that you need to respond to wrongness in your heart is at this level. The degree of response that you need. He is trying through this series of six to get you to understand that we're not playing games. That we're talking about darkness in your soul that extinguishes the light. This is why Jesus is telling us at the beginning of his ministry, if you want to understand what it means to follow Jesus, the light of the world, you have to understand the darkness of your heart and be absolutely committed to bringing the light in to remove the darkness. That's what he's talking about here. If your right eye causes your symbol, if this thing is causing you to lose the kingdom, Whatever the cost, get rid of it. Whatever the cost, get rid of it. So he continues on. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. Now we need to understand this a little bit. Even though I'm not talking about the topic, I'm talking about the text. We need to understand this. Wives in this time period had the equivalency of cattle. Women who are married to men were treated in, in, as a legal arrangement. We still do this, right? We still have to get a lawyer to end a relationship because there's legality stuff. But back then, this is why it talks about wives. If you're go it doesn't say it in the framework of what if the woman wants to leave the man. That wasn't even a possibility. The possibility was, okay, I have this certificate of marriage to this person. If I'm done with this person, I need to give them a certificate that says, you're no longer my wife. You are now free to go. 
There was a very different society around women and men and marriage back then. But we can't lose the point. What Jesus is saying is, it's been told to you, and if you're going to dismiss your wife for whatever reason, make sure that you do it legally and give her a certificate so that she's free of the relationship too. And of course, Jesus is going to change it up. He says, but I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife, anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. The victim of adultery. If you're a follower of Jesus and you dismiss your wife for any reason other than she broke her vows to you. You're making her the victim of adultery. What that's saying is you are an adulterer. If you dismiss her, uh, we have irreconcilable differences. Get over it. We have trouble communicating. We've both grown on different paths. Find a new path. What Jesus is saying is it is not acceptable, this one relationship. Why? Because that relationship you committed before God to for life. You can only get out of that relationship because it's a commitment before God through death, and we've already established you can't kill her, or if she broke the relationship before you. That's the sexual immorality part. If she broke the relationship, the covenant bond is already broken, then you can divorce her. So, look at what the rest of it says. Anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And Dave, you said you're talking about the topic, not, or the text, not the topic. But on this topic, I have to make some clarity because there are a lot of people in church that are divorced and remarried. And I'm going to say this as clearly as I can. Some followed the pattern correctly, some did not. I'm not talking about who and which and when, but I'm going to explain the pattern. See, it says, anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Why? Because they're in a relationship already in terms of God. They married somebody else. God didn't agree that they should separate unless, now see here, unless there was sexual immorality. Anyone who marries a woman that's divorced and she had cause for that divorce, they, that relationship in God's eyes is null and void. And it's on somebody else. So a woman that's divorced can remarry if the, if the divorce was not her choice and cause. If the woman was divorced justly because the, from the guy's side that she did cheat. Here's the deal. If you decide to commit adultery and break your marriage vows, the, not only is that marriage vow broken, but the capacity to do it again is broken before God. You can't go before God twice and say, I'm going to make a covenant with you about this again. If she died, you can. Or if he died. Or if... It was a biblical divorce. So, is it possible to have God-sanctioned remarriage? Yes. It's just that the previous divorce had to be in the context of correctly done. So, what does that say? And, and why did I spend some time on it? Because I have seen this disregarded. Well, Jesus can forgive all sin. Absolutely. But Jesus is the one making this rule. See, right? This is a rule that's been put in place by Jesus Christ. He's the one who's changing the understanding of it. So we can't say, well, you're not divorced because God forgave the divorce. He forgave the sin that took place in that relationship if you re repented from it. But it doesn't disappear because Jesus put the standard here. So here's what I'll say. And you can disagree with me, that you'd be wrong. The, you can get a divorce. You can remarry if it fits the pattern that Jesus established. If it doesn't, what does it say? Anyone who marries a divorced woman, and we can the, flip the genders around just fine. Anyone who marries a divorced person that wasn't divorced appropriately is committing adultery again. We can't ignore that. 
Now I'm done talking about it. If you want to talk later about it, and, and, and I, here's part of why I, I focus on this, because I don't want to skip by it, because I think, A, we would have overgraced this, and B, we have divorced people on our elder board, on, our, on our, all kinds of places, and I can stand and say, I believe, as I understand, anything that I've been involved in, anything our staff's been involved in, anything that our leadership has been involved in managing has been managed appropriately according to the scripture but not all have all the time. So that's the end of that. Now, why does this matter? Jesus is changing the paradigm. He's raising the bar. He's saying, no, you can't treat people like certificates because people are people. They're not certificates. So we have Jesus talk about anger, talk about lust. He talked about divorce. Why these? They all involve people. If you're angry with somebody, if you have malice towards somebody, that person is a child of God. If you have lust towards somebody, that person is a child of God. If you have a divorce against someone and you're going to remarry someone else, that person is a child of God. And here's what's true. For God so loved the world, all of these bars that Jesus is raising have to do with relationship with God and relationship with man, which we know those are the two commandments, right? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That means you'll do anything that God says. Love your neighbor as yourself. That means you do anything for them that you would do for yourself. God so loved the world. I can't make a decision to be angry with somebody for my benefit. I can't make a decision to know that they have grievance against me and still function with God. I have to go to them and fix it. That's the bar. I can't harbor lust in my heart for another person and know that they're the daughter of the king. I can't because God loved them so much he died for them. I have to also. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. This is what Jesus is setting up. They must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. So there's guys and gals, probably a few, sitting on the mountainside, listening to Jesus. And as he talks, when we get to the end of, by the end of the uh, Sermon on the Mount, the crowds are back there with him because it says the crowds are amazed. As Jesus talked to his disciples, more people started to hear and more, some started to gather and listen. How many responded? We don't know, but the disciples were there from the beginning until the end. And what they're hearing is, I'm changing the game. I'm saying, you've got to die if you want to live. That you that you want to foster, that's what we'll learn later in the, in the letters, we'll learn is our human flesh we have to have die. Those things that you have been taught, we're going to have to unteach. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That verse hasn't come yet, but that's what Jesus is saying on the mountainside, is you are going to have to transform your mind if you want to follow me. And I'll help you do it. That's his promise. I'll help you do it. It won't happen instantaneously. It's a process, but let me lay it out for you. That's what he's doing. And he's going to do it with three more that we'll talk about next week. Don't conform to the pattern of this world. Don't try to make a cedar shed the way that you make a three-tab shed. The old pattern doesn't work. You're going to have to learn the new pattern. Don't think that it's okay to do things. I'm telling you, if you are involved in behavior that's putting you above somebody else, you're not meeting the standard. Why? Because Jesus put himself below everybody else. Not just in death, but in life. He served others. And you might go, well, aren't there times in the Bible where Jesus was angry with somebody? There is. But we're going to have to wait for that to understand that. Right now, what Jesus has said is, if you're angry with somebody, you're subject to the fires of hell. Why? Because you're choosing you over them. Now, we could talk some other time about, is, uh, what, if, what about child abuse? What about these major things? This is, it's kind of the same argument. Look, we always jump to Adolf Hitler, right? Well, what about Hitler? Hitler 
It was a one-time thing. There are exceptions everywhere, right? We will find later that it, it be in your anger, don't sin. But that's not what Jesus is doing right now. What Jesus is doing right now is saying, you, and he's pointing at you, and he's pointing at me, and he's saying, if you want to follow me, everything has to change. And all those things that you were taught when you were a kid probably aren't true, or they're at least much bigger than you thought they were. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What Jesus said is, you have heard it said, but I say to you, it's different. I'm going to ask you this. Are you willing to do what Jesus said? Are you willing to say, I want a firm foundation? And the firm foundation comes when I make the choice to deny myself, to deny those things that I want, and elevate others above me. Am I willing to say all these things that I have listed as important are secondary to Jesus at a scope that I still probably don't understand? I can tell you for me, I kind of like being angry with people once in a while, particularly people I don't know. Somebody at the grocery store, somebody on the highway, Judy and I have been out walking. Uh, we go walking every day now because we have a dog that would eat us if we didn't. And, the, uh, but, and, and Judy, a couple of weeks ago, made a decision, you know, there's garbage everywhere. After, after the snow and uh, garbage cans were out, stuff was blowing out. But there's not all just, uh, there's also people drive down the street and throw bottles out their windows. All, uh, we live in a neighborhood that's just filled with trash. So Judy made the decision that uh, I'm going to clean it up. And I was less than excited when she first made that decision. But it's been kind of fun. And now we're walking and the, and the streets are, are clean, mostly. Although we went out today to, to take our dog out. And even after cleaning the streets, we, she still, we came home with one of those Safeway garbage bags full of garbage. But there's this one strip on our, on our walk that there's a ditch that's too deep for us to get in in the mud and rain and all of this. And in that ditch are water bottles, half full of whatever, but I don't really want to know and stuffed full of cigarettes with the lids thrown back on. And the best we can figure is somebody doesn't want to use their car as an ashtray, and so they stick their cigarettes in this bottle, and who knows what fluids are in there. And then when, it's, when they're done with it, in the same place, it's a ritual for them. They're driving by, and they roll the window down and chuck it out. Or they're walking and chuck it out. But why would they? I don't know. But, but I can tell you there was a piece of me when she was picking up a few of them. This is my wife who I love, and she's beautiful, and, and, I, and, she, and, and she's handling these nasty bottles of... Oh, meh. She does wear a glove. But there's a piece of me that likes being angry with whoever that guy is. I'm assuming it's a guy. If it's a gal, I apologize to half the human race. But part of me likes a little bit of rage. I honestly had the thought when I was walking along, God, take him out. <laughs> I had that thought. I don't know what it meant. No, I do. But I kind of like that feeling. Because it does tick me off that my wife has to pick up these disgusting bottles. And then, I, but I have to walk backwards at some point and go, Jesus, I can make all kinds of stories up of what, how I've done things too. None of it matters. Maybe I've never thrown a piece of trash out in my life. Doesn't matter. Jesus says, I don't get to do that. That's a challenge for me. And I can make the challenge go away by ignoring it. Or I can say, I need you to change my heart on this one, Lord, because I'm supposed to love that guy or gal. You've got your own stuff. I, yeah, you do. We've got to read the Sermon on the Mount with the commitment on the front side. I'm going to do whatever Jesus says. And when I find places where I'm not, what is it I'm going to do? Repent. Change directions. That's it. I'm going to ask you to consider this week before we get to the second set of I, uh, you have heard it said. Will you do it?
God, I'd ask that you would help us honestly consider, because it is, for me, hard to consider some of these things. And some of the ones that are coming up next week, hard to consider. But you're very clear. The bar is high. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ, I have to be willing to change who I am. The things that I like, they breed darkness in my heart. The things that I don't want to change, because I believe that it's the firm foundation that will keep me solid and it will help the kingdom grow in me and spread to others. I have to be willing to do what I don't want to do, to change. Help each one of us consider. Help each one of us see clearly that our decision is honest and truthful before you. Bless my friends. Ask that you're with them. We're so looking forward to being back together in person. Anything that anyone needs, Lord, pray that you're there with them. You bring encouragement. You bring hope. Pray this sermon was not a discouragement, but an encouragement to draw close to our Savior and listen to his words truthfully. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and if you need anything, please let us know. Have a great week.